I'm getting ready to glue the leatherettes back onto the camera. I'll start at the camera base. Let's prop this up a little bit. Okay. So I've got my leatherette here. I've cleaned it up as well as I can, which is not as well as I'd like to, but it's as well as I can. That adhesive that was on there was troublesome to say the least. I've got that all scraped off as much as I'm able, and I'll just apply some adhesive to this one. What I'm using is called ADOS F2. It's designed as a contact cement. It's good for leather, rubber, fabric, various things of that nature. It's not designed to be used with vinyl. And it doesn't glue vinyl well. It's reasonably low in uh, ketones as far as I know. And it's works quite well. It's usually reliable for these leatherettes. Doesn't melt them, make them go into a gooey mess or anything like that. Which is not to say that it is always going to be safe for any type of leatherette in any situation. Because leatherettes probably varied quite a bit in their composition, in the type of material, plastic material they used to give them their plastic leather-like finish. And as a result, different leatherettes are probably vulnerable to different solvents. Right, there's my leatherette. Got to make sure it's all seated down neatly in the recess. Some of the edges, there may be a couple of little uh, threads of cloth around the edges. That would not be uncommon. Around here, I can see a couple. Now they're okay. I'll, I can come back and trim them later if I need to. I just want to get make sure this leatherette's down well in that recess and it's stuck flat. Leatherettes typically shrink over time which means that they don't automatically go back neatly around raised bosses like we see here. But that's looking good. I'll put the advanced lever back in place so I can put the leatherette patch on that and the tripod surround socket surround up here It's got a bit of gunk in there. That'll be adhesive in there too. Yeah, it is. This only goes on one way round. That post sticks up through it. Yeah, that's gone on nicely now. I've cleaned out that adhesive. And there were two fine screws that held that in place. The leatherette ring that goes around that base there, that was particularly troublesome to get free from the adhesive. It's because it's uh, 
such a small area it lacks a lot of structural strength and so it was awkward to get that prepared you just haven't got enough surface to hold on to while you're busy peeling and scraping at the nasty glue it was on there It's probably a bit over generous. Now the leatherette does have a pattern. It's worth trying to get your leatherette patterns to all run in the same direction. The excess adhesive comes off in rubbery strings when you rub at it if it squeezes out from the edge but only while it's fresh once it dries it won't okay that looks good and I'll do the patch for the advanced knob So it'll remain a mystery as to why exactly someone needed to take the leatherette off the base of this camera at some stage in its past. There are lots and lots of options for things like that. But most likely something broken with the film advance. All right, that looks good. That's our leatherette on the base of the camera. I'm going to turn my attention to the front of the camera. I'll do this side first. Being a larger piece of leatherette, I can just apply some adhesive direct to the leatherette and then spread it out. Need to make sure you get good coverage right to the edges. The edges are particularly important. If leatherette's going to peel up it's going to peel from the edges. Nothing peels up from the middle. It peels up from the edges. This one corner there looks a bit light. I'll just get another drop of adhesive to go on there. As I said, this stuff's designed to be used as a contact adhesive, but I don't use it as a contact adhesive. Contact adhesive you would put on both surfaces. You would leave it until it got tacky, dried out to the point where it was just tacky. And then you would press both surfaces together and they would immediately bond together and be entirely immovable. Well that wouldn't suit for leatherettes because there's always an element of uh, 
needing to adjust the position to get them centered to get them as neat and tidy as you can so I always do it like this apply leatherette to apply the glue to the leatherette then apply that to put it on the camera and get my shutter release button back on there and there's a leatherette patch that goes on the shutter release button and I've got to lay my hands on that because it was here a second ago but it seems to have decided to go walkies okay well we'll find that in a minute Put the leatherette on the other side of the front of the camera here. I'm fortunate indeed that these leatherettes are in good condition. They're not overly dry. They're not overly brittle. That's a blessing. It's a shame about the adhesive that had been used on the base. But that aside, the leatherettes are great. Leatherettes normally shrink. You normally got a bit of a gap top and bottom. It's often a very small gap, but see that you get the leatherette centered so that the gap is only a tiny gap top and bottom and not nice and snug at one side and a big gap at the other. That would catch your attention straight away. Well, that's good. I'll find that other small patch and get that glued on. Well, as soon as I turned around, of course, I lay my eyes on it. So I'll just put a touch of adhesive on that. And that just goes neatly into that recess in the shutter release there. So that's my leatherettes back on the camera. That's great. So at the top of the camera, I've got to put my meter back. And then I can close the top of the camera up. Well, the time's come to getting closer to... Uh, the time's just about there to close this camera up. I've got to put the meter back in place. But before I put the meter back in place and close the camera up, I need to put the missing mirror back in place here at the back of the finder. So I've got to glue that on. And the meter window that had been pushed down is looking a little bit worse for wear. It's got a few scratches on there. I can only assume that someone put their finger on it and gave it a good twist and uh, scratched it up on the top of the meter. That being the case, I've got to see if I can polish this plastic window to remove the scratches from it to improve its appearance and get that back into the body here. I've already straightened up. That's Crimpton. The, the edges here that it goes under, it's crimped in about four places. That's, that's considerably easier to deal with than the one windows on a Retina Reflex S or 3S because they're crimped in about eight places. But it means I have to push those crimps back out. I just use the tip of an old butter knife to do that. That works very well. And it just, just need to roll those edges back out so that I'm able to 
fit the window back in, press that into place, and then crimp the edges back down on it. There's a few chips on the corners here. That's where it's been pressed down past those crimps. Somebody must have stuck their thumb on the top of that metre window and given it a really good push. Scratches are on the inside, I think. Difficult to say which was the... Oh, scratches are possibly on the outside, so I'm not sure how people did that. Never mind. I want to get that window tidied up first. I'm just going to polish that with some Perspex polish so there won't be much to see there. And I will come back when I'm ready to put that window in because I'm likely to spend 20 boring minutes polishing that thing. Well, I'll see if I can get this window pressed back in. I'll support it up on this wooden block. Getting the thing centred up is the biggest problem. Oh, it really doesn't want to go in there. That was it, just snapping into position. So I'm looking at the damage. You can see a tiny chip here and here. I don't think they're bad enough to... Uh, stop that being a worthwhile repair. So now I'll use the tip of a screwdriver to fold over that lip and crimp that window in there. My alternative here would be to replace the whole window complete with frame I can probably find one but that brings its own challenges because then I've got to crimp that into the top cover I think that'll do I think that'll work well enough for my purposes I'll just give that a, a last clean with a bit of um, glass cleaner to make sure that plastics as clean as it can possibly be well, this is the mirror that's dropped out. It's just blowing specks of dust off that. I'm going to have to apply some adhesive to this at both ends. This On the silvered side, we're wanting the silvered side to be inwards here. And then pop that into position. Should be fun. The problem with dealing with a mirror like this is getting it glued in position the glue has to be fairly rigid when it's set it also needs to be reasonably thin and be quite useful at sticking glass that's
Okay, we've got some clear adhesive there, not something I would normally use. But I do not have any anything particularly wonderful to do this job here today. I'm pressing that down firmly so that that glue squeezes out as much as possible. I need that mirror to take the shape of that frame. And I'll look through it and see if I can see a window, and I can. The window, of course, is here. And through the lens on the front of the camera, the top there, you should be able to see your aperture and shutter speed numbers. I'll leave that to set for 10 minutes and then I'll put the prism on the camera, put the top on the camera and see if it's any good. Cross my fingers. I've popped the prism back in the camera, the meter I've got going and it appears to be accurate at that point. Now take note here, I've got my film speed set at ASA 10. I have got my shutter speed set at B. And my aperture scale is halfway between 2.8 and f4. And at that point, the ASA and DIN scale are directly in line with the top of the camera. As you'll see, as I move my film speed scale, you see that at that point, which is halfway between f2.8 and f4, my ASA and DIN scale markings are in line with the top of the camera. And that's a good place to start. So if you're putting your meter back and you put it back in that position, that's probably a good place to start. If your meter reads incorrectly, you may find that when you test it, say, I think I had, what did I have mine set to on my tester? I had mine set to ASA 50, set to 125th of a second, and on my calibrated light source, I was expected an F, an aperture of F8 to read correctly on my meter. And it, I think it read F11. So how did I overcome that? Well, remove the two screws that hold the meter down at this end. Slacken the screw that holds the meter down at this end. And then, without moving anything, you can lift the meter up, which disengages the gear from the drum underneath. Move your aperture scale to where you wanted it to be. In my case, that was F8. Lower the meter back down. Make sure it's seated on the gear correctly. Put the two screws back at the end. Tighten the other screw. Go and check it again. And that was the job done. So... The camera as it stands here now, that's ready to close up. I can put the top on that. And uh, I'm expecting good things from this. I'm sure it'll behave nicely for me at this stage. The top cover's cleaned, ready to go back. The meter window, let's put that in place. You can see your meter scales there easily enough. The meter setting button, I'm less certain about what's going to happen with that yet. I've got still got to test that to make sure that I can lift that to change the film speed. It may be possible that something's bent in here. I'm concerned that when that plastic window fell and someone then forced up the button here, they may have bent a lever internally inside the meter, preventing the meter from moving up correctly. I'm about to find that out. So I'll pop these loose screws back in the top, test my meter setting button and find out what I get. Alright, with that wire soldered back neatly into position, I can put the screws back in the top cover. Be very careful not to 
make a mess of that one. These two screws, you've got to be careful not to drop them. Excuse me. That was one of my local camera customers bringing me his computer that he wanted me to fix. But um, I stopped doing any computer repairs over 12 months ago and I am not helping him deal with his virus problem now. So I've sent him on his merry way with my best advice. I'll just check that I can change my film speed. Yep, no problem. Okay, so that's all good. Next I need to do that rewind knob. Right, rewind knobs in the Reflex 4. The first thing to do when you're trying to assemble this is to get that central shaft correctly aligned. Now at the moment I can tell it's not because I can't pull it up all the way. I'll get that out show you what it looks like. There's a little tab on here that engages with a slot on the inside of this plastic piece. It's awkward to get this seated correctly. If you don't get it seated correctly, you will not get your rewind to work correctly. So I've got to see which way up that slot is. I think I've got it pointing to the back of the camera, so I'll slide that in. which is easier said than done. Push that in, see if I can hit that slot. No, that's not it. Now I've obviously got that at least 180 degrees out. Let me pop that out. Rotate that. Pop that back in. We'll try it. No, it doesn't want to go in. Oh, it's going in. Right. There you can see the rewind. You can see the, how that centerpiece sticks out right through the center of the rewind. That's exactly as it needs to be. That tells me I've got that correctly engaged. That's part number one. Let's start here. I'll pull this all to pieces because it's probably falling to pieces if you've got it and put, taken it off your camera and you won't have a clue how it all goes back together. This, right. Well you can see that that obviously drops into there. That fits in that way. Then we have this spring with a button on the end of it. The button goes on there like that. Goes against the end with the pins. Then we've got this piece. This piece has got two tiny protrusions on it. They go either side of that spring. So we pop it on like that. There I've got the whole knob all in one piece together. 
correctly assembled. So we're off to a flying start. Bring back the camera. Here is the spring. Alright, that shaft's trying to get away. Let's put that, poke that back up the hole. Get the spring over the shaft like that. Now I'm going to take some synthetic grease while I've got it here. Run some in that groove. That's where it's going to clip into the latch that holds the rewind knob down. Now, presenting this to the top, I can rotate this into position, screw it onto that shaft. I'm keeping the screwdriver in from the inside to make sure that I'm that shaft stayed up. Right, now I should be good. I can put a screwdriver through the centre there to stop that turning. Just do it up lightly with your fingers. And it should clip down into position like that. Now if you've done it right, when you swing this arm up and lean on it, this should pop up into a position where you can rewind your film. At that point, this is still engaged with the film cassette. So you can rewind your film. And when you're done, you just press the thing back down again. So that's all that's required there. It's um, a bit tedious, you might think. But it actually works quite well once it's there. This, of course, was misassembled when we got it. It didn't work. When the arm had popped up, it had lifted this right out of the film cassette because that steel shaft had, uh, it was mis misaligned. Okay, at this stage, what have we got here? Well, we've got the camera body all finished and ready with a nicely working shutter for a change. And this is ready for me to uh, service the lens before I send the camera home. Now this lens is exactly the same as many other Zenar f2.8 50mm lenses that I've serviced previously and you'll find one that is almost certainly with every Retina Reflex S, Retina Reflex 3 um, or similar models that have videos of me stripping these down and servicing them. This one here, to be quite honest, everything works nicely. Um, I'll service it, but I probably won't notice an, any difference at all in the way it moves. It's The function is smooth, everything works nicely, but I'll clean it, get rid of any sticky old grease, and put it back on the camera. But you won't need to see all that because as I say, I'll have other videos showing that process. So here you can see, isn't it interesting the way these are constructed? You've got your moving depth of field pointers. As you change the aperture, you'll see that the depth of field pointers swing over a wider and wider area. As you close down the aperture, you'll see that your depth of field pointers cover a larger area of your focus scale. That's quite an ingenious mechanism, that. And when everything's serviced and freshly and ready to go, nicely lubricated and everything moving smoothly, that, that works beautifully. When, when the lens hasn't been serviced for 50 years and it's a bit dirty and dusty and it's had a hard life, things don't work so well. In this case, we're lucky. That's all good. And it'll be even better than good once I've serviced it.